previous session was primarily just getting you primed for this. But to give you an overview of what was going on, and what I've tried to do is condense nearly 12 workshops into a one and a half hour presentation. So each workshop could, in fact, last half a day. So you can see there's a lot of detail that I've skipped over. But nevertheless, I know each person's circumstance is different. It's, you know, the idea of this is you just pick the things out you think are appropriate, OK? The framework, I think, is fairly universal. In fact, you could apply that same framework to education, if you like. You can apply it to aged care. You can apply it for mental health. You can apply it for disability. It's, in fact, the same process, OK? So you've now got a big picture, which I'm going to touch on today to set the scene for the, t for the template. Oh, that's right, I've added a few things here too. You can see I had this last night, which you haven't got, but there's some of the workshops that we've done. Um, prim primarily the principle of this template now is really, it's an opportunity, it's no more th than that, okay? You can choose whether you want to do it or not, but I would say to you, you don't have a choice. And what I'm saying here, we encourage you to consider your circumstances and the typical challenges and strategies around that, OK? I mean, it's, in, it's in your best interest to do that, OK? And the format we usually involve with is group interaction, a bit of talking, a lot more talking than we've done this morning, usually workshopping, breaking up in the groups, all those sorts of things, but time doesn't permit this morning. Um, information sharing, experiential learning, that's sort of like learning, learning on the run and clearly skill development as well. And there's a book that we put together, which is all the workshops, which is in fact very similar to your handout, except where they're words, we have like lines there. And as we go through the slides and a certain thing hits your mind, you would write those things down. That's the process of fleshing out, <coughs> which is what I'm gonna try and do now, flesh things out. So um, the idea of the template now is for you to actually flesh those thoughts out. So. What I'm saying about the template, it isn't just a, an administrative thing. It's actually a day-to-day -day working type document. It's not a plan, nor is it a, um, I would just say, the, the be-all and end-all. It's simply a way in which you can better manage your circumstance, OK? By putting things down and actually be prepared or think it through or to feel like you've got things under control, whatever it might be. So what's the purpose of it all? It's a practical way of being able to manage care. It can either be used in part or whole, depending on the circumstance. You can take a page out, or you might want to use all the pages, depending on the circumstance. Um, the headings and the content is meant just to prompt. doesn't mean that is your plan. It just simply says these are some things, OK? Uh, it also improves communication. No question about that, and ultimately better care outcomes. I might also say that you've now stepped out of the, out of the bracket of just being a, a parent or carer you're now becoming more like an advocate or guardian when you start to do this because it empowers you in that process, OK? Uh, feel like a greater feeling of control. Uh, maybe the, uh, the articulation of personal needs is an important part. And the other part of this is an understated thing is that there's a lot of fragmented things going on with, with care, safeguards, financial and legal. They also tend to be separate activities, OK? This is an attempt to actually pull some of this together, OK? And the common element that pulls that all together is the care environment. The care environment will, in fact, define the things that you might want to put into legal documents. It will define the, the, uh, the, 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 the focus of any financial arrangements, structures, or whatever that might be. It also helps the care environment in terms of the, uh, the enabling things. So it's one thing to talk about care on one side, but if you can't enable it, well, it just becomes a bit of a... I think smoke and mirror thing. Uh, you need to be able to, to um, have the substance of it behind it. Which brings us to James's um, template. Um, James's template's basically, and I'm going to talk to it as I go through it, guys. So these are the headings that I've got up there. So you can actually turn to these pages, if you don't mind. It's all in, in order. So the first thing we want to look at here let me just go back. Oh. Sorry, I, I thought there was another. I thought there was another slide there. Okay. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm actually getting a bit confused. 
when you said the template, I thought that I would get it black. Yeah. I'm already me getting the same. Now, what I'm doing is I'm providing with content, which will say, in James's case, this was his consideration. Is it my consideration? If it is the same, you might change James to, to Julie and, and have that same thought, but modify it to suit your circumstance. We've, we've had blank stuff before, just the headings, and we don't seem to get very far with it. It seems that you need to be able to put some things down to be able to express what it's about. So the idea of this is now... My methodology would be I'd have my blank paper. Your blank paper. Precisely. And, and you... No, I know that. Well, true. I mean, actually, I might say that whether it's disability or whether it's care or aged care, each person has their own set of requirements. It's, it's a care environment more so than the than the circumstance. Okay. So. I'm. You're going. We've got this imaginary physical change. Yeah. And that gives us the common ground. Yep. And then I just do my own. You might delete most of that out. Yeah. Okay. Right. That's per that's the whole permanent point of it. So it should be on your stick. Yes, I've got that. So I've got a key for what's, what have I got on that? You've actually got the soft copy of that. Yeah. Yep. But I don't have a blank one. It's still no, what you do, you, you'll, you'll save that in the name of your person's name. Yes. And then having that, you can then go through and then delete the stuff that doesn't apply. So I can delete you it? You delete it. Uh, got it? Very, very clever. So what I'm trying to do is within a couple of hours, Having set the framework for this, home, yep. James, yep. No, you're not going to delete. You know what you're going to do? You're going to use the replace function. I'm going to use the replace function. You're going to say find James, replace with Jennifer, yep. and 142 replacements will take place one go. Now it's been around since WordPerfect and oh, whatever. Yeah. It's been there. It's actually in the top right hand corner if you want to try and find it. It's find and replace. So the idea is to use the technology to make life a little bit easier with this stuff, okay? I'm, what I'm saying here, if I just gave you the headings and I just spoke about it, it's not the same as, as actually working through like almost like a case study and saying, well, does that apply to me or not? And if it doesn't apply, I take it out. And the, but this is the bit I want to put in. So bang, 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 you type it in. Got it? It is. In fact, I'd say there are some points here that are, are pretty universal anyway. And I'll get to them as we go through it. So if you look at that first page there, which has got those little boxes on it. That's why I was looking for that slide there. Might be further on down. No, it's not there. It's funny I didn't put that in. It must have took it out. So you can see here with those little boxes, personal profile, caring people, care environment, safeguards, finances and legal, they're basically all the elements that, that we need to consider. Okay? So there's the, it's to do with the person, it's to do with the care environment, it's to do with the finances and the personal and the legal safeguards. Not one person in each of those boxes can, can provide you with all of that. If I was a solicitor, I could be pretty good at that last box, but I really did, wouldn't know too much about the financial considerations around managing uh, support pensions or, uh, or other fi financial arrangements which I need to consider in that everybody's individual case. In my son's case, it's to do with disability support pension and the allowances that go with that. Do they know anything about that? No, they don't. So careful consideration has to be given to all those financial things before you set up the legal structures. The same thing with the, uh, having a, a person giving you financial advice without understanding the legal safeguards or the care environment. So again, they need to be directed in a way that you think best in the way that, that needs to be managed, okay? So you actually put all these bits together. So that little diagram there is an attempt to talk about the scope of the template and the considerations around each of those things, okay? Perhaps it'd be helpful to clarify everything you mentioned before, that you, you might have different templates for different situations. Like you might have a, a template for the doctor, a template for the lawyer, a template in the, for the estate yeah. design, those, those, each, you, you wouldn't 
have everything. No, no, you'd only take out the bits that required, and, and the whole represents everything, okay? Yeah. But you only take those bits out, okay? All right, so basically what I've got here, this is just the, uh, the breakdown. First thing is all to do with uh, the person. And um, who is this person we're talking about? And there's multiple... Absolutely. It's a, it's a team effort. That's what we were talking to Doug before. It's a team thing. You know, it's not you saying how I interpret it. In fact, the profile is written, from, in, written in the first person. I like to do this. I wish to do this. My dream is. It's in the first person there. So if you look on um, page two there, um, a typical profile, uh, this actually is a bit like the objective or the goals of the plan. And rather than having that, we talk about the person's dream, which I think personalises it a lot more than, uh, than purely just goals or objectives. Okay? And for James, it's about what's important to him. So I like to walk to the shops or the beach. I like to go to the movies. I like to meet people. I like to go to this. It's that. It's their story. So in this case here, you'd actually encourage them to write th what they would like. And you can best draft it if you like and discuss it and whatever, but it's essentially who is this person? The idea is we're not losing sight of the person. The idea is that on the first page you actually see the person first and then their support or their um, um, disability needs are seen as a secondary process to who the person is, okay? So basically, I won't go through all that detail there, but again, you can see that that's, none of that would be appropriate for you, for you guys at the moment. You've got to write your own little profile there. Great? Okay. And then you get into things like, remember you're dealing with, sometimes you're dealing with a lot of people who will say, yeah, that's good, but they may not read it. Reading is a problem these days. So the idea is short and sharp is better than long and lengthy. Agreed? So the idea of this here is at the bottom of the page there, James's likes. They're just dot points. And also what, on the next page, James's dislikes. Again, series of dislike, uh, points there. Now, we, I know each case is going to be different, but each person will have, this is part of building their profile. What, what are their favourite activities? And this question about what people like and admire about James is about personal valorisation. That means who this person is of high value. This person makes a big impression. This person is amazing, right? It's that sort of statement about who the person is. And there we start at the bottom of the page, we're now starting to get to what people need to know and to do to support James. Notice the use of the words I'm using. It's more of a colloquial phrase. Uh, what do you need to know about James now, now that I've met the person? Okay, we well, now can move on to what he needs. Is. So in this case here is, 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 is his uh, prognosis or his circumstance around medical considerations. What is his disability? What are his support needs? What is his, uh, um, de um, some description of, of, of who that person is? So I won't go into any detail. Again there, none of that would be appropriate, I don't think, given the individual circumstances in this room. I don't think much would be there. But again, you need just to pick and, pick and choose what there might be there. You see, there's a level of detail there. How many times have you been asked to describe um, your son or daughter or, or person that you're looking after what their condition is? How many times have you been asked for that? Quite a few times, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the idea is if you can make it short and sharp and precise, you're only doing it once, but you're doing it in a very precise sort of way. You might take some of this off, some of the prognosis that you've already been handed and to incorporate that within the plan, okay? So you're describing uh, what people need to know. So you've met the person, now what do we know about them? And then on page four there, we go down. Uh, some description there about James's seizures, a question about how, how you would um, uh, maybe talk about um, uh, your situation in that context. I don't know whether that's appropriate or not. Uh, and then the important part here is this medication well, we've been involved with situations with not just myself but where I've acted as an advocate for other parents uh, walking into a room and, and particularly doctors and I, I don't want to highlight that, this is not a doctor bashing exercise but they'll, but they'll actually prescribe drugs without asking the question well what other drugs are they already on? 
I don't get that stuff. So rather than try and figure out their problems, I walk in and say, this is the medication that person is on. At least you make them aware of it. And also from a liability point of view, that if things are prescribed in a way which may be adverse, you've got a, a leg to stand on rather than not saying it. Okay? So if there's adverse outcomes around prescribing medications around, around, around say, um, uh, eff efficacy around, um, around uh, medication issues and maybe some sort of harm, you can actually say, well, this is what I've given you. And the positive side of that is that the, 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 the person you're talking to because of, of the fact that they now know what this person is on, they can do their job a bit better too. That's the reverse of that, okay? So I think that the prescribing what the medical treatment, I need to keep that up to date. You notice here I've got a little, little note there. And I've also got contact information there. So if anything goes wrong, I'd like you to contact these people. Huh? Not somebody else who doesn't know the person. I'd much rather you talk to those people. So contact information. So hopefully, if you're talking with a service provider, this front page, the personal profile and what people need to know about James, is it now included on their file? You with me? So it updates their filing and whatever, and if they need to, maybe their, their computing systems or whatever it might be, at least they're aware of it. And then the question around dental. I don't know whether that's an issue for anyone, but for Chris it is. Um, and again, context around dental care. And then... On page five there, we then talk about personal needs, about, about what's going on here. Um, in case of James, who requires 24-hour care. For, for some of your sons and daughters, they might not require that level of care, right? But there's some element of care that needs to be required. I, and it's tough for you to figure that out. Um, and I talk about here a balanced diet supplemented with vitamins and regular exercise and without active care his well-being can be adversely affected by cold and flu injections, um, infections, low nutrition, passive lifestyle and not being involved with other people. They're major factors that will affect his well-being. Pretty obvious but nevertheless that's a need. And then the rest of it is really to do with his personal position. He's slow to eat has no known allergies, so if your son or daughter's got allergies or whatever, you can actually spell that out. Uh, reactions to certain things, um, questions of mood, questions of becoming sick, what are the early out outcomes of that. Um, generally healthy, likes to take his medication together with a cup of tea or juice. Now, that might seem a bit, 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 um, bit ordinary, but if you didn't know Chris and you just wanted to give him some tablets, it becomes a big issue because he won't take his tablets. Now, I don't know whether that applies, but nevertheless, this is what applies for Chris. Meal times, not a problem. <coughs> but I suspect that most of you aren't in that, in that situation where, where, where most people can eat their meals without support and so on. Dressing, same thing, toileting, bathing, grooming, domestic skills, community access, recreation, literacy, numeracy. There might be some questions around that. How, how, how well they can do that, how can they express themselves? Uh, can they write to a point where it becomes effective or they understand numbers? You know, those questions. Yeah? Something you need to look at. <clears throat> On page seven there, any sleeping part? Uh, this is particularly for stayovers or those sorts of things. Emotions. And again, this might be a big area for you guys. <coughs> I suspect it might be. And around behaviour, emotions and behaviour particularly when you start talking about uh, psychotic episodes or whatever it might be, and the best way to be able to manage that, okay, without knowing any of your detail. <clears throat> In the case of managing James' behaviour, it's got largely to do with the people around James. I don't know whether that's true for you guys. I think it is. You get people who we can connect with, you'll get a better outcome than those people who he has trouble with, that sort of stuff, okay? <clears throat> so I've just given you a, a, a profile of James's behaviour. I've expressed it warts and all, you know, the best I can in a positive way. But if people need to know about his behaviour and how you can best manage it, I think it's good that you become able to describe that. Okay. And of course, you'd only share this information for those who needed to know that, you know, confidentiality and privacy. You wouldn't share it with everyone. It's just those who need to know. So it might be only that page you might share with the, um, 
with the uh, uh, um, uh, service provider or Medico or whoever it might be. Okay. <clears throat> On page eight there. Um, even just for Chris to have choices presented one at a time and to look for a yes or a no is a better thing than trying to talk about a whole range of things and trying to get his consent over a lot of things. <coughs> Excuse me. The nature of people who support James Best. I think you'd have a picture of that in your own mind. Okay. What would happen if it was an authoritative, demanding, fairly strict sort of person lobs into the place, starts telling your son or daughter what to do, what's the erection going to be? Vamoose, tell them to get stuff, whatever, right? They'll have their own reaction to that. So the most critical thing in any service support is the relationship. Get the relationship right and everything else then will, will follow. And that's the best thing to do with, with the nature of people. And then the question of communication. If it is an issue, maybe you might want to describe how, how, how your son or daughter communicates. And the last part of the profile here are the things that we haven't been able to figure out. Things to figure out, things we still need to know. Long-term care accommodation, what's going to happen in the future? Uh, the choices there are very, very limited. And it's usually the family home in 95, 96% of the cases provides the solution. The question is how do you keep that going, particularly if you guys aren't around. A uh, question of, of, of a maybe day programs, I don't think that are probes. Maybe maintaining varied and regular exercise. Leisure and social activities, important. Lifelong care structures or care safeguards. Keeping up with the rising cost of care, financial structures, trust, trustees and legal arrangements. What I'm saying there is you need some advice on that. So as things come to mind, and we were talking before, and you haven't got an answer to it, you might put it in this heading here. So when if you talk to a caseworker or somebody who purports to provide you with some advice and guidance, you can then turn to this part and say, look, I'm glad we, we're having this conversation. I'd like your advice on the following things which I haven't been able to figure out. So therefore you've got a list of things you can start to work through. Okay? And might get some guidance on that. So that's the personal profile. That's this part here. This part here. Uh, and, and this part here. here. So that, on that one page is basically broken up into the profile, what people need to know, the nature of people and things to figure out. That's what I think is pretty basic. If you do nothing else but that front part, you've got the beginnings of better communication between uh, anybody that you're dealing with or any other service providers around the question of who is this person and what you need to know. Does it make sense? Okay. Now each case is different. Now it might be that most of you think, well, none of this applies at all just take it out and if you want to put some other headings in feel free to do that but this is just meaning it's just meaning to give you a prompt and some of the things have been thought through you might think oh that's a good idea I'll keep that one okay that's all it's meant to do and that's how it becomes the template so with just headings by themselves it's not sufficient to get the, the juices flowing yeah. okay all right are there any questions with that first part Um, if, if the person who has this uh, is taken away in an emergency situation by ambulance to a hospital and you're not around, how will the medical team get access to this? Uh, if that, perhaps that person you're caring for is not even living with you, they're yeah. living on the other side of Sydney. I don't know, Doug. I think each case is... Uh, you might have it already on the, on the medical file somehow, you know, like the GP, they often contact the GP. It might be to say that if anything, go, if you need any advice, see your, your daughter's <coughs> GP and then he can access the info, at least you've provided it. I mean, there's no way your daughter's going to walk around with this <laughs> just in case she, she won't do that. But that's a le legitimate question. I mean, they could walk around with that. They could. Yeah. Well, that's not a bad idea. And, and things you need to know about me are already on this. Yeah. Uh, it's a bit like a, um, a Medi, 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 Medi Alert thing or a Medi Band or whatever it is. It's got the information. Yeah. I mean, you can imagine one day it wouldn't be too bad to be able to transmit that through 
you know, a device that allows you to, to do that, right? So this stuff eventually, I think, could be on your phone. So you go into a meeting, got the phone, turn on the phone, and you've actually got the information with you because you've got the phone. The, I, the technology is a possibility, but I think it's the things you already put into place that might help that as well. You know, regular doctors, regular consultants, regular service providers, I think should have this on their file somewhere. Okay? I don't have an immediate answer, mate. Uh, in the case of Chris, I just simply have instructions up that if Chris has a, a, have a, has a um, uh, epileptic seizure, the first step is contact me. The next step is to do this, next step is to do that. So within the people who provide care have been given a procedure to follow. I, I don't know, mate. Okay. Okay, any other question around that? I, I think that idea of the USB is not bad. You plug it into, almost plug it into the, you know, but the hospital systems are hopeless, man. They, they can't even manage one hospital. How can they manage across the state with, I'm thinking, information? Yeah. They've all got different information systems. There's no way they can translate it across. Maybe the future has to be brighter than what it is at the moment. And then the next part of the template is um, how people will care. Basically, in the, in the case where you might have trustees slash people, I have, the idea there is you might have, uh, I don't know, uh, p uh, like trust arrangements, and trust arrangements could be actually setting up a trust, a discretionary trust, which is pretty significant, for a, a, a significant asset. It's got to be big assets. Otherwise, the, the fees and the cost of setting it up would be quickly eroded by that. Huh? So if you're talking about, you know, a home these days, I mean, goodness me, we're talking about, a, you know, a million dollars plus almost, right? Mm -hmm. It's a significant asset, right. right? So it may be that the transfer of the um, title of the house could be set up into a, into a trust arrangement. And that way you've got some control over the, over the selling of the, of, the, of the house, say, or it might be superannuation or it could be savings or it could be investment. Whatever it is, you've got like a separate entity separate entity actually actually managing the um, that on behalf of the person your son or daughter and that entity is in fact a, 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 a has a responsibility for paying taxes and everything else so a discretionary trust has to be pretty significant right coming down a bit there are other forms of trustee arrangements you could put into place which could include uh, trustee bank accounts so everyone can have a trustee bank account where you might have multiple signatories to operate, particularly if your son or daughter can easily be taken advantage of. So in order to have access to certain finances, a number of signatures are required. That's a form of a safeguard. Okay? So trustees, a trustee arrangement can, can, can be evident in a number of, a number of considerations, which I'll, I'll go through in the back part of it all. So how people will care for James? The question here is what their roles are. As a trustee, that's different to people who provide loving care, who provide care. That's a separate sort of role to, altogether. And the question here will, how care will be provided? So in the case of how people care for, 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 for James, there are some principles here that you might want to just consider. And some of this stuff actually comes from out of the United Nations uh, basic protection of human rights. So if ever you get involved with an argument and you want to talk about care requirements not meeting basic rights, and you now as the advocate or a guardian can say to that service provider, I believe my son and daughter is not, not, uh, not um, his basic rights are not being considered here and this is the reasons why. So it's a very powerful argument that you can put together. So how do you describe care? Well, maybe it's about sustaining and protecting rights actively seeking to include James in community activities and lifestyles, growing James' status as a valued person, and ensuring James is treated with respect and dignity. Now those principles can apply aged care, uh, any part of life, in fact ourselves, right? So if you wanted to specify the basis of care, you've got a United Nations um, con um, basic human rights, which translates down into national rules, which then comes down into state rules. 
So basically if these rights are not being considered, the service provider or the aged care provider, what it is, is actually breaking the law. So it's pretty powerful in that sense, okay? Rather than just saying it should be a, a high quality life, living a good life, whatever, why not back it into some existing structure where you can use it for a point of argument and at the same time scope the question of care environment. And what's their role? Well, I think it's about providing value through their leadership, relationship, and if required, being creative. That's, I think, some of the things you guys do already. So if, if one of those three things are missing, I suggest the value decreases. What have I said there? Leadership, relationship, and creativity. So if you're not providing leadership, it means the value becomes less. If you're not building up relationships for your son and daughter in terms of service providers or people around them or whatever, that also diminishes the value. And if you're not being creative, there ain't much value. Value is used in a loose sort of way, providing value for this person without quantifying it. So if I think in terms of leadership, relationship, creativity, and you're ticking all those boxes, the value is high. Also, the converse of that is if you put a person into a job and they don't have leadership, relationship, or creativity, I suggest to you the value of that job is very low. Agreed? So relationship, I think for most people, uh, if I can say who require some degree of support or whoever it might be from low t to high, that what seems to stand out is this relationship thing. If they're comfortable with a person, if they want to see the person, if the person can relate to them, you seem to get better outcomes than those who just walk in and walk out. So the penny will drop one day that if, if you're dealing with, with this group of people who require that relationship thing, the professionals who understand that better will get better outcomes than those who will just walk in and walk out without establishing that relationship. Okay, so a big thing. How people would provide care for James? Get the relationship right and the rest will follow. Yeah. And then I've said here basically, well, what sort of guidance can I give these people? Well, the guidance I could say would be have regard to uh, James's best interest, have regard to the wishes expressions in the latest version of James's plan, which is this. I want you to actually carry this out. Assist James to develop his abilities to a maximum, to be independent, live a normal lifestyle, and includes participation in mainstream activities and lifestyles. Do their utmost to advance and reflect James's status as a valued person. Endeavour to protect James. That's a big one, protection. If you're dealing with vulnerable people who can easily be exploited by others, and you'll have your own assessment around your own sons and daughters needs there, the protection could be very high or it could be very low, right? depending where you are. But the case, a uh, couple of cases I, I was referring to at the break was a case of uh, two families, each with daughters, mild, mild uh, support needs, uh, getting by, very, very loving, trusting girls they were, uh, got married. Uh, before that, the families actually bought them a home unit up at Ride and Eastwood, and, um, and they were living there, got married, both uh, partners moved in, part of the marriage arrangement, oh, of course it would be part of the marriage arrangement, but part of the, their accommodation arrangement, and then years went by, both the marriages broke down, family law court, and they simply split the assets in two. The parents got up and said, no, but hang on, we bought that for lifelong care, long-term care for my daughter, because she has specific needs. She needs protection. And it was an admission in those, both those cases that the family law court can only act within their own, their own jurisdiction and not, that's not a consideration. So, in hindsight, these are two parents who've come along to workshops and said, this is what happened to us. In hindsight, this is what we would now do. We would have, should have made sure that both our girls did not own the asset that the asset could have been owned by a trustee or maybe their brother or sister or, uh, who would protect them and not take advantage of them, but trusting, loving people. And therefore, in this case here, severe case, the asset wouldn't have been treated the way that it was. So this brings up the question of, of appropriate protection around vulnerable people. I believe if somebody can easily be, be, be taken advantage of, my bottom line is they shouldn't own any assets. Yeah. Full stop. So they can have. And that was your lifetime yep. Even though the young adult person might say it's not fair, it's not fair. Yep. Mm. You would still see the answer on that one. Would you? But we're talking about the big stuff. Yeah, I, I just want. I just want to 
Yeah, it's about tough love. And, and even though it's hard to do, it might be limited in the sense of um, having access to like an operating account, which got limits on it, yeah. rather than an endless thing which could easily yeah. go out the, out the door. Yeah. 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 So I'm talking about significant assets here which can easily be taken advantage of. There are too many cases where uh, people have been taken advantage of. So this question of protection, and I guess in some ways for you guys, to think of it as a form of a safeguard and having things in place that might be in their best interest. Uh, you know, and, and, and that's being creative around what you do. Okay? But this question of, um, um, of, of exploitation is very much part of, of their life. They're exploited either in, in work situations or social situations and also certainly with a financial thing. Financial things have been used as a way to buy friendships and to be popular and I'll buy you this and I'll give you this and whatever and, and people tend to take advantage of that. And, and the high cost of that is that basically um, um, uh, the value of, of the person is linked to their financial well-being rather than who the person is. Got it? So this question around, I think the enabling things and the safeguards can easily be incorporated within the financial structures and also within legal arrangements, which we can pursue, all right? Can I ask you um, whether you're aware of... That, that I'm, I'm trying to push you. Yeah, well, I'm not sure whether you're aware of the question around the um, trying to get people to think about it. So basically, around, around the question of, of safeguarding around vulnerable people is a huge issue. You can't do it all. You can't all be there all the time. But for, for the assets and the questions around long-term accommodation and what's going to happen when you're no longer around, that's, that's linked to the ability to provide an income for funds for a reasonable level of care. No question about it. Rather than going through the normal process of crisis outcomes, dealing with each case by themselves and taking what's available. What you're doing is you're making a difference between having a choice and not having any choice. Okay. Absolutely. Yep, agreed. No, I'm not. No, I know, I know. Yeah, I'm assuming that that advice is given, but you might also just want to take out a simple caveat on your uh, selling of your property. Mm. That's not difficult to do, mm. and which says these are the conditions by which the property can be sold. Mm. That probably be the sufficient safeguard and not take the other option, okay? So I've got caveat mentioned on the back page here, I'll get to that soon. And, and here, the last one here, take into account the effect of the exercise of their powers, we're talking about the trustees, on any social security benefits, taxation or duty or any trust for James. So what they're doing is actually paying James's way by making sure that things like all the legal considerations are being properly carried out. For most parents, setting up a trust is not an, not an option. Too expensive, can't afford it, yeah. too complicated, can't do it, or, or for all those reasons. It does. Yeah. They, you don't know whether do needs it in the future for their own reasons. The that gets to this question of ownership of the asset, okay. yes sir? So, you know, if you talked about the, you know, the loving family context where people are truly um, committed to the well-being of that person, you may have arrangements within the family structure. Going outside the family structure, you might have things to do with people who you think who've, are connected with your son or daughter, who might take up a trustee type role, who are prepared to sign the cheque provided everybody else signs the cheque, so you might have multiple signatories on it, and that becomes a safeguard. There's a number of ways of doing it. That's that creative part I'm talking about. Okay. And then the next question comes up, how, how care will be, um, be provided, which is this question here. Um, I've just tried to spell it out. And here again, this, this is a, uh, what you say, a grab bag of just ideas about the sort of things that might be need to consider in any care environment. Now, I don't know whether that's applicable or not applicable, depending where you're, where you're up to at the moment. Uh, this may or may not be um, uh, suitable. 
But basically, uh, James' care environments is actually reflects advocacy outcomes. And what are advocacy outcomes? Well, they're about addressing and rectifying situations where he may be disadvantaged. We're now talking about care accommodation. Think uh, aged care as well. Striving to minimise conflict of interest. Engaging in vigorous action that positively resolves short and long-term issues. Maintaining fidelity with him. That's a good word, that, fidelity. I don't want you to, to betray him. You're here in this care accommodation. I want you there to be looking after their best interest. Aids care, disability care, support care. I don't care what that is, but I want you to be that strong with the person. And don't see yourself as a service provider, which is a cop-out. I want you to have a stronger connection with the person and to represent them in a way that goes beyond just providing a service or a product. I'm sorry about my passion in this, but I feel very strong about the notion of having products and services around care. It's a, it's a nonsense. Supporting his endeavours into... Have you talked to the Minister for Disability? Yes, I have. On a number of occasions. I'm still talking to him. Yeah, good. <laughs> it's a lifelong plan. And things have changed, I might say. Yes, I have. They have. It seems to me you've got to be at one end of the pendulum to get something to move at the other end. Yeah. So if you say it too quietly, nothing much happens. <laughs> so you get up and you say... You get up on, say, 2UE radio with uh, um, uh, Alan, uh, yeah, Alan Jones or whatever, and you say, the nature of lifelong care is not understood by any politician out there. All of a sudden you get shunk, you know. But it's like the media stuff. We all know that the, it's a media... You've got to see, you guys, in a sense, if you really get incensed about this, you get onto the Manly Daily, whatever it might be, front page news, guess what happens? You get the political outcome. Ray Hadley, isn't he the spot? Ray Hadley, DYRSL. <laughs> My son met him down there. He knows Ray very well, right? <laughs> so it's the political game as much as the other. But it's also knowing, knowing what works and what drives a lot of the organisations through the political process. Even Senate inquiries around questions of care is not necessarily enough to change or influence um, service provision but what it does do, it changes the acts which actually drives the service provision. So we've had a number of Senate inquiries around these questions and they're actually changing the acts in medical and also in, in disability. So we've had some wins there too, okay? So what sort of care accommodation for James? Well, it's all pretty obvious. Uh, for you guys, it may not even be appropriate, but this, if you're running a group home, like you are a family home, which is like a group home, big family of people together, the, the, the elements of those things are about uh, uh, good safety, around nutrition, around um, constancy. Imagine having carers coming and going all the time. What does that do? What are we doing in terms of a lot of the service provision? Because we have trouble hanging on the staff, we engage um, 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 temporary or, or casual carers coming and going through ag agency, that's the word I'm thinking of, mm -hmm. agencies, people coming and going. And, the, and after about the, the 20th or 30th age, the person coming through the place, you won't even take the time to even say g'day to because they're only there for the moment and gone for the next. So the relationship stuff, which is the prime purpose of care, has been dismissed because of some of the economic considerations and the way in which we run the organisation. So from your point of view, you're looking for constancy of care as well. Good people, connective people who can build the relationship and, and work from that. The chemistry in the home, layout of the home, particularly if there's a physical need for wheelchairs, whatever that might be. A competent, caring person, uh, daily care, what that might look like, and an appropriate independence to a point. So all of you have got your own points that you can point to, I think. You're independent up to this point, but beyond that, you're dependent. <laughs> whatever whatever that, that line is, right? You'll, you'll know what that is. Okay. So again, how care will be provided. So um, I'll get on to the, the options later. And on the next page there, page 11. The area of care and activities must be complementary and managed in James's changing needs. So in this case here, I don't know whether or not you'd have a number of service people coming in. Probably not. True? Might be lucky to get one. Yeah. Maybe. Well, the point of that table there was a communication between the different service providers that know each, each is what they're doing. Yeah. Okay? Doesn't apply. Next page, page 12. 
basically the care accommodation options, and these are very similar to, uh, and your home could be a, a semi-independent. We're up to a point, um, people living there uh, get to do what they need to do, but up to a point. A co-residency, housing support, equity housing, congregate care, probably no, family home. So the purpose of this is just to describe what the care accommodation options might look like in the present and also in the future. So you know what your son and daughter might need for the future. Maybe a continuation of what they've got. True? So how are you, how are you going to make that happen? Think about that. And you, at least you're spelling that out. So if this question comes out, you can say, this is what best suits my son and daughter for, for care. Okay? This is probably the number one need. What's going to happen when mum and dad are no longer around? What are we going to do? And if the home needs to be managed with a bit of support in it, maybe we've got to think about that. Okay. Okay, next page, page 13, personal safeguards. These are distinct from legal safeguards. Personal safeguards are those which, which the person um, draws from because they feel valued, they feel included, it's part of their network, it's part of their geographic area, they know people in the area, they've got friends, all those sorts of things are part of that, what I call mm -hmm. personal safeguards. So a question of personal care in that table there. Who are the caring and protective people? Well, maybe that might be useful to just to document that. Uh, respite care, I don't know, whether you, not applicable. Care accommodation, whatever that might be. The support network, who are they? What goes on there? Uh, and how that can be better managed. Um, work, purposeful work, high social interaction, one-to-one. -one. This one could be quite a big area. And the other one also could be education as well. Mm -hmm. uh, social needs, also big and also uh, specific needs. Okay, I know that some of this stuff here doesn't quite fit, but my, my answer to that is you just simply take out those things which don't apply, okay? Mm -hmm. But what are your sons and daughters' personal safeguards? What's important to them? For them to be able to express that would be a good thing. Eh? My friends, my social thing that I do, my work, you know, going shopping, going down the mall, whatever it is, that's part of who they are. Okay? So if ever an arrangement was made which took them out of that area into another area, you're actually upsetting their, their personal needs big time. So I don't know whether you want to think about that, but it might be about maintaining that structure around them in that geographic area, which is so important to them. Okay, strengthening them, getting them involved with some of the social and community activities, sporting, I don't know. All those sorts of things could be part of that, part of that answer. Okay. Okay, and then we get into the, on page 14 here, we get on to the, some of the um, um, uh, tokenistic stuff, and that's what I think it all is in in terms of James's parents, what do they need? Well, they need to be able to manage the challenges associated with care. They've done pretty well so far, but they need that ongoing support. They need a support network. They also, as they get older, need a bit of home care and help in order to be able to maintain that. Uh, am I eligible for that? Uh, can, what, who do I talk to? Those sorts of questions. Guidance and support with, with, with James's needs. I can't keep doing it. I'm getting older now, and therefore I need some support around that. Engagement with other parents and carers in similar circumstances. That's like having a parent support group. Really important, that one. It's uh, having a cup of tea with somebody and just having a chat and talking and whatever, which, which does provide support, and maybe even these sorts of forums enables you to build up that, some of that connection with other people in your area and so on. Um, what else? Uh, they also need a break from time to time, which I guess this is part of this weekend. This is respite. Having a break. <laughs> Picking up some information. Having a nice meal. You know, in good setting. Hey, coming out of this feeling charged. But the research shows you that feeling good will only last as long as, as soon as you get home. <laughs> <laughs> But if you've got some <laughs> knowledge or understanding you've picked up on the way, that adds to the value of it all. Right? So the pampering weekend is good while it's going on, but it, it, it also needs a bit of that knowledge in, thrown in there as well. 
And the other one too is the, is the siblings' needs. Now I don't know whether that's applicable or not, but where are they in all this? So if you're actually producing a, a, some thoughts, getting them down, you need to get them involved in the discussion. It's a joint effort. Yeah. What do you think? This is what I think. Uh, what have you done, Dad, in terms of the future with Chris? That type of conversation sooner or later will come up. So you can initiate that by saying, I'm going to work on this document, um, maybe pick up on Doug's point, I want to have it available and when I've updated I'll send you a copy and maybe they've got copies of that, whatever it is, so together you're actually working something out. Uh, I don't know whether it's possible or not, I don't know. It might be just good friends as well, as siblings. And then what are the financial arrangements? Well, the financial arrangements, if you turn to the next page, page 15, this is again just meant to be a checklist. In the case of 24-hour care, I don't think that's probably applicable, but I'll tell you, if you're providing 24-hour care in your own home, what would be the cost of doing that? It's significant. If you had to, if you had to engage a home to do what you did, the sort of numbers we're talking about there, minimum number there, is, is about $50,000 thousand dollars a year. So what we're doing is putting a value on what you provide which is if you have to get somebody else to do it, and that's I might say is understated, uh, you need an income of about 50 odd thousand dollars. And even if you had an organisation running it, you'd have some expenses on top of that again. Advocacy, do you need that? Do you pay for it? Yes or no. Daily living, respite care, I don't know if it's applicable or not, but you might require a bit of that from time to time. Education could be huge. Financial, bank accounts, whatever that might be. Government benefits, what benefits are you uh, eligible for? That's a mystery. Wouldn't we asterisk that and say, let's get some advice on that and for now and the future? Um, home modifications around physical needs or maybe medical dental therapies. The question of, of health insurance, that's pretty expensive. Where do you get the income to help offset the cost of of insurance. So questions come out about that, uh, particularly when you're talking about specific needs. Parent support, personal care, and specialised transport, legal accounting, financial, whatever it might be. The idea of this t sheet is to actually just develop some of the costs of care and to figure out, they might be just estimates based on what you think, and you come up with a total cost of care. So particularly when I talk with other other people in other workshops, principally around disability, and I ask them the question, well, what is the cost of care? If you had to put a number on it, what would it be? And the number is very close to $100,000 a year. And I'd suggest to you that number would probably apply to most households anyway. So the hidden cost of care is often carried within the family structures. Huh? If you do what you did and compared it to what you need, the cost is around about $100,000 a year just to run a home, do things, pick up things, shopping, cleaning, whatever it is, put it all together, you're talking about a cost of about $100,000 a year. And that's what I was talking about, that national insurance scheme in the earlier part of today. When you start talking about the numbers, the numbers we're talking about with, uh, with um, um, disability alone is something like about 230-odd thousand people in New South Wales. 230,000. Multiply that by 100,000, what have we got? 23 billion. What are we doing for the national wide insurance scheme? 12 billion, so we've already got a shortfall. Now if we threw in other needs into that pot as well, you can see it's gonna fall very short. But the idea of this is to have some understanding of what the cost is, and therefore you may be then eligible to see whether you could be eligible for certain allowances or things you've never applied for. And questions around that comes out, okay? Okay. So understanding what the cost is, we then say on the next page, page 16, what has this family done? This is the stuff that you'd share within the family. You wouldn't share it with anybody else. Um, you talk about maybe a, a, a trustee bank account that was set up for the Smith family, $50,000 in it at this point of time, earning 6%, because an income of 3,000. Now that $3,000 could be used to help pay for the health insurance, you see? So you might prioritise some of your costs on the previous page to see how you might get an income to help offset the full cost of that. So things like 
like bank accounts or investments could be used in a strategic sort of way. In this case here, uh, this is just for residential home funding. Uh, again, the full costs of that are actually spelled out. And for that to happen, you need funding of about $50,000 a year. And then if you use a service provider to be involved with board and lodging, again, these are only indicative costs. You're talking about expenses there, about eight, eight, two, nine. Most of the money for that comes out of a pension or an allowance or whatever it might be, where they might take 80 to 90% of a pension. And then you, this is where you carry most of the cost, under personal care. In the family home, shoes, clothing, other needs, medical, health insurance, dental, special needs, contingency, just to put some numbers in there, which does mount up. You'll be surprised how big that number is. So in this case here, it's 17,000. And in the other case, to do with activities around other options, probably the principal one here might be education, social and work. So the idea now we've got a, a, like a table which identifies the expenses, identifies the income and identifies the funding. And if you put all that together, 65 is required, an income of 21 is required and expenses of 34, let's call that $100,000. So all of a sudden we're starting to get some numbers on the cost of care. Right? Now, with you guys, I think you carry the burden of, of the cost. If there is a burden, I think you carry it. I don't think you receive much in terms of funding or, or allowances or whatever. True? Yeah, a little bit here and there. Yeah, does anyone get a carer's allowance? I do the parenting payment. Is that the same thing? Yeah, it's the same thing, yeah. Yeah, it's not much. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it just recognises that you're doing it and whatever. But if you sat down and actually, the idea of this is to actually, this is not meant to be perfect, it's just, just purely just trying to spell out what the cost is, okay? Why? Why do we do this? Because the next step, now you're actually going to seek advice about how you might be able to manage this. So the financial advice you get now can be very specific. What are we going to do here for care? What are we going to do here for personal care? How am I going to cover some of these activities? And I believe the financial advisor should be able to give you specific advice on every one of those categories. Got it? So now you're getting some advice, which is basically um, around the questions of, of, of maybe investment or what to do with the family home or whatever it might be. Uh, I know of one family that petitioned their family home off and rented part of it out in order to help cover for future costs because there was no income coming into the place. Mm -hmm. So, you know, desperate times for desperate things. Huh? So, again, you just need starting point is to understand what your costs are. So, most of this I don't think would apply to this group, but certainly elements of it would. Okay? And then on the next page, page 17. Uh, you don't need to know anything about disability support, although that might become an issue. Have you heard about the Special Disability Trust? It was an attempt to, um, uh, about four years ago, to put up a, like, a tr like a discretionary trust for a sole beneficiary. So, you know, if your son or daughter was seen as having a disability, if that's the case, there's already some sort of uh, restrictions around that because under a special disability trust, they must have a severe disability. Yeah. So that'll just about wipe everybody out of this room anyway. And what do they mean by severe disability? Well, the author, who happens to be Stephen Booth, um, said he meant significant. But when it was put into, into legislation, it came out as severe. Oh. So severe means the top end of high needs. Severe, profound. So there's mild, moderate, severe, profound. So it's in that top category. But interesting enough, the, 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 the Special Disability Trust only looked at the level of disability rather than, the, rather than the needs to be able to do that. So a mildly disabled person, a person who's on the go, requires a lot of tracking, uh, may, might be escaping, whatever it is, they require more attention than a person who might be in a wheelchair who has hardly got any cognitive ability at all. They're, they're relatively easy to look after because their behaviour is not a question mark. Uh, their, their, their emotions are fairly, fairly stable. All those questions are around that. So it seemed to me that the Special Disability Trust had a good idea but it was implemented very badly. So the outcome of this is watch this space. 
So Bill Shorten and all his mates are saying, we'll fix this up. So I don't know whether or not that's in the near future or in the long term. But questions around the, the Special Disability Trust was a good idea, particularly if you want to lock some assets up just for a sole purpose of looking after the person. Great idea but at the moment. So if you talk to a um, financial advisor around this, and we're not talking about people who want to sell you AMP products, I'm talking people who understand something about this world, um, they should be able to talk to you about special disability trust, uh, discretionary trust, and any other structure that might be required. Okay? And then we get over on page 18 here. This is the one that you'd only share with your immediate family members. To answer that question, Dad, what have you done for Chris? What's set up? Well, this is part of that answer. In this case here, there's a trust that's been set up. Uh, the deed of trust, tax file number, even the, uh, the bank account that's linked to the, to the trust is mentioned. Um, the special disability trust, let's assume we've got one of those as well and how that would be managed. Question of the father's superannuation, uh, whether or not um, 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 it's appropriate or not. Nevertheless, who is the superannuation with and the member number and any bank accounts. So that's the stuff that I would provide my, both my daughters with and give them the power of attorney to operate these things if anything should happen to me rather than waiting for something to happen to me and, and Chris's costs are still there and how are they going to access that? Well, probate and, and the process of, of that takes anywhere between 3 to 12 months. We can't, we can't we, that's not acceptable. So if they have a power of attorney, it means particularly with the savings account and that they have immediate access to that. And in the superannuation, if they're named as beneficiaries, again, it just goes straight to them. So there's a number of things you can look at around the financial structures. So each person would have their own simple, uh, would have their own um, suite of considerations around that. Even a bank account, uh, a trustee bank account, we're almost there, guys, so be patient with me. That's what I'm saying. We normally spend a day on this stuff. <laughs> and I'm on to the last two pages now. Um, these are the legal stuff now. Th this is the checklist that you can have when you talk to your friendly solicitor. Would you recommend you a financial planner Yeah. Yeah, usually the same people who have had the experience, you know, like the solicitor who, who had care outcome. Yeah, there are, there are there's a few out there, but most, most don't. Most of them are in the business of just selling portfolios. I worked in the financial industry trying to understand it for a while, and, uh, and they just haven't got a clue. So if you get a bit selective about who you go after, and if they can't talk to you about these um, things that I've just been through, I, I suggest that you're talking to the wrong people. Do you think um, some of the charities like the Lifeline Financial Council yeah. There's an example. Yep, I think so. They're very good. Yep. Yeah. They are very so, mm. Mm. There are exceptions. And there's actually an emergence. There's an emergence of understanding of this and a number of companies are starting to position themselves. I noticed there's been a series of talks on the Northern Beaches in the last six months by two or three different organisations purporting to understand the question of care and working through some good case examples, they've given some good thought to it, okay? So you just gotta be selective like what you're talking about. Okay, last little bit here guys, just before lunch. The legal and, 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 legal and, and um, the legal, uh, legal safeguards. I just found a typo there. That should be legal and personal safeguards. <laughs> it's funny, isn't it, how you read this? A hundred times? Yeah, a hundred times at least, and to see it. Um, first thing around is personal wills. Everyone, everyone got a current will? Current means less than three years. Oh, less than three years. Yeah, three to five years, they generally say. So what's that? Current, current so wills. Will. Look what we done. Personal will. Oh, every three to five years. Yes, you do. If your circumstances change or if you just want to update them. Because when the, if wills, all wills can be con contested. Yes. So if, they, if, there's been, if it's an old will, 10, 20, 30 years, what, I don't know what the number is, the, the a person who's contesting could claim that things had changed and, and, it, and it wasn't a reasonable thing. So, 
<laughs> That's it. So a question around wills, and the reason I raise that now is because there's an opportunity now to incorporate some of this work into the testamentary part of your will. It can either be an, as an attachment, which could be seen as a memorandum of wishes, or it could be included in the testamentary part, which I'll mention here. So the, clearly the, be, the beneficiaries need to be spelt out. And the reason why you want to include this work into the will is that it, it provides uh, guidance to the executors. You know, this is what I know what's going on and, and these people who are going to execute the will in terms of distribution and whatever, um, they need to know some of the things that I know. So that's why it's in the will. The other reason it's in the will is it strengthens the will. So if there is contestability or family conflict around those questions and often a lot of families have this and contestability of the wills are on the increase, I don't know whether it's to do with energetic solicitors drumming business up or <laughs> whether the social setting is so complicated these days, you don't know. But basically contestability means that they'll question the will in terms of why it's done the way it is done. Now if, if the expression within the will says these are the reasons why I have done what I've done in the form of a care plan, it strengthens the plan enormously. So even a magistrate would understand that in terms of making any judgment about that contestability. So that's the advice I've been given based on, it's a bit like an evidentiary thing, you're providing more evidence as to why you're doing what you're doing rather than a simple uh, um, bland, not bland, but a, a, a standard type of will, okay? So the idea here is, is in the testamentary part might be the distribution and protection of assets, an equal share of assets with a, with a, su a surviving spouse, a testamentary trust to describe descendant arrangements. That's a good one because it says here, in a sense that, that if I die, uh, the arrangements are these, and then when Chris dies, the arrangements are these, mm -hmm. which picks up the rest of the family. You yeah. see what I mean? Yeah. So you've got at least, they're called descendant arrangements. Mm -hmm. So you might just want to flag that. Um, and then the question of, of if, you're run, if you have a trust, you might use this process to actually appoint directors of a trust. So on my death, I appoint my daughters and, and Anthony as, as directors. Um, and you define their roles, uh, what they expected to do, which was in the earlier part of this plan. Remember on the first page? And then the other party here, we, we're going to include the lifelong care plan for James, either as an attachment or actually incorporated within the will. Mm. Got it? Yeah. It's a big step forward, that one. Uh, some solicitors will see it why and others will say basically we, we don't do it that way. Or you say well you'll find somebody else who can do it that way. Yeah. You're the advocate now. Does it have to be signed to be within the world? It's like an attachment. If it's an attachment, it stands outside the document. Well it's still part of the will, but, but, but the sign off within the will, you know, covers it. Okay? It can either be incorporated within the will or as an attachment, okay, depending on, on the solicitor. Mm. And then we get down to this question of, um, of a person's capability. In the case of James, he's not capable of making a personal will or appointing a trustee or even uh, an enduring power of attorney or enduring guardianship. So if your son or daughter is capable of appointing you as an enduring guardian, that's a good thing to have because uh, dealing with the uh, uh, some service providers and maybe the medical world, they require your consent for certain things to be done rather than assuming as a parent they can do it. Mm -hmm. So you make it be known that you're in fact their, uh, their guardian which has that extra authority in, in making arrangements. So uh, enduring power of attorney is the financial. I appoint my daughters as, as, as the, whatever the term is to execute this power of attorney. So all they've got to do, and, and we've seen it with other circumstances where you present the power of attorney to the bank and that's, a, that's good as continuing with the business, okay? That's all that's required. And enduring guardianship is really to do with a bit of a, a lightweight thing, this. It's a difference between legal guardianship and enduring guardianship. Being a parent doesn't mean that you're a guardian. You know that one? Yeah. Okay. So let's just talk about the enduring guardianship. Enduring guardianship is something that my daughters, uh, I might appoint my two daughters as enduring uh, as guardians of me, 
Uh, I can't appoint them to be enduring guardians of Chris, no. right? The only way I can do that is to go to a magistrate and convince the magistrate it's in their best interest that, that I or my daughter should be his guardian. Okay, that's enduring guardianship. For, for capability, if a son or daughter has capability, the, the conversation is between them and the solicitor. And if the solicitor thinks they are capable, that's where you've got to convince them. They'll then sign off on enduring guardianship. So if they're not capable, uh, that becomes problematic with trying to find a magistrate or a local court to actually work, work through that, that situation. Legal guardianship is the question around really big threats, really big questions of crises, homelessness, suicide, uh, uh, abandonment are the big issues that go to Belmain, that's the, where the tribunal is over there. And you, uh, no longer being just the parent, you've got to stand up now and almost become the authoritative advocate and guardian to convince a group of three people up there to say, this is the best solution for my son. And, and, they, and if they are convinced, they will then give me limited orders, like court orders they are, for specific areas of care, finances, accommodation, whatever, 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 for a period of time. And it, when that period of time comes up, I've got to make fresh application and convince another three group of people in the tribunal there. It's very, supposed to be very informal, but it's quite intimidating. And, um, uh, and then legal guardianship will continue. Now, th that's the big one. That's the heavyweight one. So if you've got legal guardianship, nobody can do anything under those orders unless they have your authority. Okay? So there's three, three things happening there. Power of attorney, finances, enduring guardianship, more like lifestyle, and, and legal guardianship, specific areas of care. Mm. cannot make them yourself. That is the real, real purpose of that yes. role. It's not usually taken up until people don't think about it until they're old and frail. But probably everybody needs it. Yeah, I think, so. I think everyone needs it. Yeah. It's basically when you need to have an extra bit of authority, you can when you say can't it. Speak for yourself. Yeah, when you can't speak for yourself. There's also a, a living will too. Separate thing again. That's your, when your life is um, end of life decision. End of life decision. Yeah, yeah. What interventions are you agreeing to at the end? Of yeah, life? and so I might have to make the decision on behalf of Chris to turn yeah. off the life so support. Say you have a heart attack or a stroke. Yeah. Those kind of things. But yeah. There are other reasons why I can't make my own health care decisions, like I've been in an accident. Yep. And that's why everyone should have the enduring guard. Agreed. So when you do your will. You do your enduring guardianship at the same time. Yeah, but okay. it's also a young person that you call trying to persuade them to do that. Yeah, they have to agree and they have to they do that because then that's clear that they're, they're not able to make their decisions. That's crying. That's right. I might say that it's like a bit like Murphy's Law. If you've got the authority, in most cases you don't need it. Yes, exactly. It's, it, it's like if you haven't got the authority, there'll be cases that will come up where you, where you, where you require it. Yeah. What this process is. And let's all do this. Yeah. Agreed. Let's all do this. Good idea. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I just had that inspiration. Yeah, I. Not just because they've got that condition, it's everybody. Yeah. Well, I think there, there are three things personal will, power of attorney, yeah. enduring guardianship. They should all be Those three things. So when you do your will, you do the other two as well. Okay. Just something to think about, guys. And again, we're putting these things in as safeguards, all right? May, may that you may not even need them, but they're there. The cost of doing that is no more than what you would do if you did a will, okay? Isn't that usually offered to you? I know our solicitor offered that to us. They offer. So both yeah. normal yeah. people at the same time. Yeah. Same time. The power attorney yeah. is important. Yeah. 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 And then on the last page, here's the guidance. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
trustee bank account, that's where you might have multiple signatories. Living will, we talked about with regards to medical care and life support. Enduring guardianship versus legal guardianship, the difference there. Advocacy uh, on an as-needs basis, perhaps. And the family property is an interesting one, where you could talk about a, a covenant or a caveat. Mm. Covenant is the use of a property mm. on the certificate of title, mm. which may or may be appropriate, I don't know. But certainly a caveat is an interesting one. A caveat is simply a condition by which things have to be met before that family home is sold. Very simple, it's not very expensive to, to set up. So you could add that to the, as the fourth thing when you talk to your solicitor, I want a caveat on my family home, which basically says this home cannot be sold until it meets these particular needs, right? which might be around ensuring that the family home will always be there for your son or daughter. So caveats are good. The example I've, I can use here is the uh, Collaroy home there on the um, southern headland. There was a home being used by a disability service group there. It used to belong to a good doctor there many years ago, 1930s, 1940s perhaps, overlooking the headland. Uh, and, uh, and the condition that he made on his disposal of that land was a, he also included a caveat which said that this land could only be used for the purposes of disability care, da 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 da. So, 70 years later, the health department in all its wisdom decides we're going to flog this land because we'll get lots of money for it. And at the point of sale, the sale couldn't go through. Oh, wow. So it's a good story to know that, that those sorts of things could happen. So the, the family home, I think, could also be useful in that regard, a caveat. It's not expensive, you just go to the land titles office, it's a stamp on the, on the certificate of title and they put a number to it. If there's any documents attached to it, they refer to the doc documents. Mm -hmm. That's it. So th that came up before and also ownership here, just the distinction around, um, around tenants in common and joint tenancy. Mm. If you're talking about property, you need to know the difference. Um, so if you talk about um, uh, tenants in common, it usually refers to a percentage, like this person owns 50%, this one owns 25%, that one owns 25%. Joint tenancy is typically a, a, a husband and wife deal in terms of owning a property and they both own it equally. All right? So joint tenancy could be another person as well, rather than just the husband and wife. So the, it's an equal share in the ownership. So again, if you wanted to look at that, you could... Uh, um, decide on whether the, uh, it's appropriate to continue with tenants in common or joint tenancy. Mm -hmm. At least have that discussion. Mm -hmm. Got it? So that's a fairly exhaustive list of things you can talk about in terms of your solicitor, your financial person, the care environment. And remember we started with the person way back here somewhere? Yeah. Mm -hmm. And what's driving that person? Their dream. Yep. So I figure that if, if we're doing stuff that doesn't meet their need, or their dream, we're, we're out, of, out of line. Absolutely. So it's a lot, guys. This is something I would do over a day. Mm, yeah. To push you all through it as quick as we have <laughs> is a bit of a big ask, but, but the benefit you've got is you've had the discussion, you might have made some notes, you've certainly got your USB now. The idea is cut and paste. Do a, do a, do a save as. Um, on the front sheet of the handout here, I think I've got some sort of advice. Here, here we go. On the top of, uh, in the second page in, under template, you want to refer to that, it's Roman numeral one. So on that second paragraph there I say the template is available as a hard copy, word file or in PDF. As a word file it can easily be modified by saving the word file in the person's name. So don't lose the original one, save as another file, with me? And then use the find and replace function that one. So if you've got a name like James and you've got another name, you say find James, replace it with Jennifer. Mm -hmm. It will automatically do a complete replace right through the entire document. And there could be some other gender words there where you might want to change uh, uh, his to a her or whatever it might be. You've got to be careful because sometimes his is actually part of a, part of a bigger word. Mm -hmm. So you, know, it's easy, it's, you can use the find function and it'll go to all the hises and you'll, and you'll put in her, 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 her. Just work your way through it that way. So there's some things in the technology that will help you do it a, a little bit easier. Uh, and then delete any irrelevant content 
and then add specific considerations under each heading and maybe add some other headings if you like and tables using the basic word functions. So this is supposedly a fairly rapid way of getting you guys up and running straight away and it's up to you now. I think getting that front part right, you know, the, 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 um, the personal, personal profile, this one, get, get that figure there, start from there and then, and then work your way through to this bucket. This is a good bucket because there's, does everyone know everything? No. But the things we need to know, at least we can, at least we can make a list of them so when somebody who purports to know, ah, I'm glad we're having this meeting today, there's some things I would like to discuss with you. Now, they may not have the answers, but you can get their help and guidance in maybe who to see and information or whatever, okay? So it helps you with that. So it becomes a working document. That's the idea of it all. Too much? Well, it's a lot, but I hope it's a lot that um, need it. Yeah. <laughs> can take it home. Too much? No, I know. But I mean, you know, the nature of this is such a complex question yeah. anyway, yeah. and uh, each person's case is is complex. Yeah. No question about that. Yeah. And, and, and you just can't plug it in and say, here it is. You've got to actually put some work into it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's wonderful you've given us a template because, I mean, you know, we've got the best to start. I know, best to start. Mm. Yeah, well, you notice I put a photo in there of James yeah. Yeah. just to give it some oomph. That's yeah. a good thing to do in your own as well, especially if you're going to use sections of it to give to a section. Yeah, and you can be as creative as you like with this stuff. So if you talk to a service provider and they've come away and given you some ideas, you can just incorporate those ideas immediately into the plan. There you go. So you're managing it that way. Yeah. And questions around finances are big, aren't they? Yeah. Huge. Huge. Questions around legal, you actually got to, unless you get somebody who knows what they're doing, mm. you've actually got to you know, gently push them in the direction that you would like to have the outcomes. Mm. You just can't take the status quo these days, unfortunately. No. And then you become a bit of a leader in this, so if you know any of your other mates in situ similar situations, you might be able to advise them too. That's the legacy of this work. It's, it's supposedly rolling out in a so way that, <laughs> that people can provide support to other people and so on. Mm. Okay, guys, well, that's, that's just about all the things I needed to say. So thank you for your attention and, and your uh, contributions. Thank you. I much thank appreciate it. Thank you very much, Terry, okay. as usual. And a very small token of our appreciation. Hope you can enjoy <laughs> it at your leisure. <laughs>